you had this mainstream success yeah. that is very glitzy and glamoury. And it's mm. like a lot of us chose podcasting because there wasn't that opportunity there. Right. So this alternative universe kind of was created. Mm -hmm. um, what is what has one been like and the other been like? Well, I mean, I had first so many years of just struggling, you know, like uh, I started when I was a, a just 18. I think the first time I ever did it, I was 17, but I started really trying at 18 in 1985 it's a long fucking time ago it's 38 years now wow. but from nine from 1985 and when i was 18 till i was you know i was just a boston comedian for years just trying and failing and and uh and then i moved to new york and i started to get some sense of power but but and i tried writing for tv as a way to make a living because i just wasn't making it as a comic but as a stand-up i worked until it wasn't really till i was like 40 that i started to really like hit so I had all those years. So that's like a whole other, you know. Right, right. People kind of forget about that. Yeah, and I, I wasn't trying to discredit you no, that not, you hadn't put I your time I don't feel in. that at all. Okay. No. But after that, then I had, yeah, I had this big, and the biggest part of it was the stand-up. I mean, that's what fueled it all was that I was selling out theaters all of a sudden. And they couldn't get, be big enough. Like, I would double the size and it'd sell it out. I would put a show on sale and it would sell out in a minute. Wow. And, um... And there wasn't a room in the world. Like, there wasn't an indoor space in the world I couldn't book. Like, we would, me and my agent would talk about where do you want to play. Like, let's go to London. Royal Albert Hall, if you feel like it. Wembley Arena. Yeah. Just any place. Stonehenge. Yeah. Fucking Madison Square Garden. <laughs> weird amphitheaters in Athens. Mr. McGregor's Greece. Garden. Fucking <laughs> yeah. anywhere. Anywhere. All, yeah. It was crazy. Like, I, I remember I would talk to one point about playing Central Park, you know, like uh, Simon and Garfunkel did. Wow. Like, it was crazy. And then the TV thing, you know, I mean, I had that show and it hit, mm -hmm. but it wasn't like Friends or something. It wasn't like, you know what I mean? It wasn't a network show with a huge reach. There's still a shit ton of people that never saw it. It mm -hmm. had pretty low ratings, my show. It got a lot of press and awards and stuff, and not even as many awards as other shows. It wasn't like The Office or something. Right. But I loved the work. I loved, to, I was getting to do the show exactly the way I wanted. So I had a huge fulfillment that way. And yeah, it was weird. I was getting awards and I was at awards shows and stuff like that. And I would meet somebody like Brad Pitt and he'd be like, oh, dude, and that kind of strange feelings and um i'm sure and your ego has to build even if you don't know it the ego is so that's weird. right that's the thing that's you that you got to be careful if you don't know what your ego is doing you're just success is very dangerous yeah. because there's no warning signs on it there's nothing cautionary about it in the experience mm -hmm. you just believe in it you're just like this is all happening because i'm good at this and because it's my time and and here we go. And anything good that happens, you go, sure, I'll do that too. Yeah. And you just keep letting it load on and you don't think about, like, you, you ever seen the uh, American Gangster? It's uh, Denzel Washington. And, yes. Uh, there is a th that you're watching him quietly build this huge empire. Mm -hmm. And then it's when he goes out in the white uh, uh, fur coat to the fight, he goes to yes. a boxing match in a white fur coat. And then the head cop, uh, the Russell Crowe, goes, Who's that guy? <laughs> like, and he's not aware that somebody has just gone, wait a minute, who's the guy in the white fur? So when you're like big, getting bigger and bigger, somebody out there is going like, what's going on with that guy? That yeah. guy's flying awfully high. And you you just don't, you're not aware of that. You just go, this just keeps being good. I'll do next year, I'll do 10 shows at the garden. I mean, where does that go? Where do you think that's going? Like now I look at it like, where do you think it, that's right. headed? Like they, it just can't things that expand ex explode. Just right. The way it it goes. Yeah. It's unsustainable for most artists in the world. I mean, every comedian has that's even gotten that big. There's yeah. been some comeback to earth moment. Every but everybody who gets that big. Right. Has whatever their vulnerability is, whatever their thing is, their Achilles heel. It's going to get hit. Yeah. Because the world tests you and it's also just more interesting to watch somebody go down. It's just part of life. Life is a zero sum game, you know. Oh, uh, yeah. So I agree. but so, yeah. But having done stuff like hosting Saturday Night Live like a bunch of times, like that was never that wasn't in my in my sights. Like I didn't think these things would happen to me. I had completely Did you really given up. not. I completely had given up on those things happening to me. And I knew, just admitted to being a writer, you think? Yeah, I thought I'd, I'll, do, I'll never stop doing stand-up, I thought, because I love it. It's it's the thing I love. Uh, but I can write. I'm a good writer. I tried f making films early, and they crashed and burned. So I'm like, oh. I'm not going to be a film director either. 
those are the big dreams, like direct movies, be a comedian. I'm going to do comedy, but no one's ever going to love it. And I'll go down for whatever I was maybe pulling in, a, you know, a few hundred people a night down and it'll just diminish. And someday I'll have to give it up. Mm. And I'll write and that'll be okay. I'll make other people famous, make Chris Rock famous, make Conan, you know, help other guys get there. And there's joy in that. I Chris, yeah. I, I love Chris. I love. He was him. my favorite growing up. Yeah, he he astonished me when he came back to stand up after SNL and get, inspired me a lot. And he was a, he's one of the best friends I've ever had, and uh, he was a great boss when he was just my boss. I just loved him. He was just the greatest greatest guy. He used to say like, you know, I'm not. It's not about me. We're all because he he hired writers that were all really good, and he said we're all the Yankees. I'm 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 in the I'm in the cleanup spot, but I'm just the guy who has this one role. But you're all you know you, you made us feel like we're all part of it, right? So I liked that work, but I had no, I had really decided, and I had started. I had a kid, and I was like, this is not, it's not gonna happen, never gonna happen for me. And then it, it, something changed because when I went on stage, I just didn't, I didn't care anymore about my a career. So I just, and I was really cranky, and I was starting to really, I went through a new cranky phase, and I was a tired father and. And I started talking about that, and then things, then things changed. You know, then did it surprise you? Yeah, it really. Did. It really it shocked did. me. And then when I got the this show on FX, the, the 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 they paid me the minimum. I got paid like you know scale. Yeah. And the show had the smallest budget of any show on television. But the point was, and it was on FX, which was nowhere at the time. I mean, they had a few cool shows. Yeah, but, but people didn't know about it. No. So I thought I'm gonna do a show, and I'm gonna love it. And it's never going to take off. It's just going to be a little show. My friend Laura Keitlinger had done this show oh, yeah. called uh, The Adventures of Jackie something. And Laura's one of the funniest people I knew. And she did a nice season on like AMC. And I thought, that's what I'm going to do. Right. One season of this weird little show. And then I'll go back to, then I'll get another writing job. That's what I figured. I had no fucking, and then we're like, you know, then we're getting on the big lists. And then we got Emmy. I was totally shocked that that happened. Um, but then after a few years, I'm like, yeah, this is, you know, it's like, if you play blackjack, you start winning, mm -hmm. you get stupid right away. You're like, I'm good. It's cause I'm good right. at blackjack. Yeah. <laughs> it's cause I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and then they just, then you're busting every hand. You're like, no, I'm a fucking asshole. So yeah, I was in a place where I thought like, I, uh, this is happening cause I know what I'm doing now and because I'm earning it. Uh. But a lot of it is just so weird. You caught a wave, you caught a wave. It was good timing. Yeah, it's interesting how some comedians don't even get the time. It's like they're where they're what their funny is in their mm -hmm. lifespan. It just doesn't match with the wave of like where society is sometimes. That's right. There's some people that are incredible, but they weren't that at the right time. That's what one of the biggest challenges in comedy is just staying good when nobody's paying attention yeah. and continuing to progress. Cause it's like this searchlight that maybe finds you sometimes. And if every time it finds you, you're you're getting better and better. Then the then someone in the somebody in the world will start to go. This guy is a good bet. They'll start putting money on you. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed that video, and you can watch another, and you can watch this one. You can watch this one. Different options, different choices. Some guy just brings you one option, not this guy. Two options. Watch one. This one or this one.